Hello, everybody. We're back. Uh, we're back for day two of API Days on the main track. And we'll continue our track on microservices, API, service meshes, and API specifications. And now we're really glad to receive one of the top entrepreneur and thought leaders of the space, Marco Palladino, CTO and co-founder of Kong, you know, the successful open source API management gateway uh, with enterprise, uh, of course, offers. And uh, he will share with us a topic that a lot of people want to hear about, about service meshes. And this talk is entitled uh, Application Connectivity, Leveraging Service Mesh to Build Modern Applications. So Marco, we're really glad to have you, uh, where you are one of the top CTO of the industry and glad to hear your talk. The stage is yours uh, right now. Enjoy the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Palladino. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong. And today, really, we're going to be looking at one of the most important things that is enabling modern applications and modern architectures, and that is application connectivity. As you know, we are entering, and we have entered since a few years now, a new era of software. We're transitioning away from monolithic applications to microservices. And as we're making that transition, we're really transitioning away from large code bases into decoupled, distributed services. The biggest difference that this transition brings is replacing the reliability of the CPU where everything runs on top of one monolith, on top of our virtual machine, for example, if it's a Java application. And we're replacing all of that with service connectivity and service connections that are linking all of our services together. And you know, really, um, one of the reasons why we're doing this transformation, you know, sometimes it's, it's easy to get too deep into the transformation without taking a step back and realize why we're doing all of this. And really what, what we're seeing is that, uh, as we all know, every business is becoming a digital business. And, and of course, when, once they become digital, we want to be able to attract new customers. We want to be able to enter new markets. We want to be able to create more reliable applications. To do that, we use cloud vendors. Uh, we replicate our systems in different data centers for high av availability, and we fundamentally introduce more and more connections with the goal of making our software more reliable and to grow our business in a faster way. As we make this transition, we are transitioning away from centralized architectures that are monolithic, they're static, they don't change much when it comes to the deployment. You know, we, we redeploy the entire thing every time, uh, the monolith component, um, you know, for some enterprise organizations that has been primarily on-premise. So some enterprise orgs are transitioning to the cloud as they're transitioning to microservices. And we're, and we're moving towards a decentralized world where we can scale our teams in a much faster and better way because each one of them doesn't have to eat this big chunk of code, but they can work on decoupled services. They can iterate much faster. They can deploy much faster. They can deploy every day in order to be able to create a more reliable application. Now, of course, on one end, the benefits of transitioning to a decentralized architecture is that we can do all of these things, right? So smaller components being deployed faster, being deployed in a distributed way. But on the other end, we introduce a few problems that we didn't have before. And that is the control and the visibility and perhaps even the security that we're now, if we don't do anything about it, we're now losing over time. You see, transitioning from centralized architectures to decentralized architectures, it's something that um, introduces the network as one of the main points that we have to take care of in order to be successful with this transformation. And the more services we have, the more network connectivity we have. And that is the good and the bad of our of this new uh, way of building software. Because the network by default, if you don't do anything about it, it's not secure. The network can be slow. The network can be unpredictable. The network, as we do much more back and forth across our services, we need to be able to log and monitor and trace all that our services are doing within the network. Now, uh, you know, when we're transitioning from, when we're building a monolithic application, Fundamentally, we had different objects. So let's say we're building a marketplace. We're going to be having users. We're going to be having uh, items that we can search for. We're going to be having all these different objects that fundamentally 
they're being described within the monolith, within different objects, different classes that we're building. And the way we communicate, um, the way we make these different objects talk to each other is via an interface. This is your typical monolithic application. Now, as we decouple our monolith microservices, the interface, it's still there, but becomes an interface over the network. So we are replacing those local function calls, if you wish, with network calls among different services. We are going to be having services that can be large or small, you know, with whatever size we need them to be, and they're going to be talking with each other via an API. The network, it's something that we always had, of course. You know, even when a monolith was talking to a database, that request was going over the network. What is changing between back then and now is that we have much more, many more services, and therefore, the network becomes uh, a problem that compounds over time if we don't do anything about it. The network requires a few things that we need to build that we didn't really have to build when our objects were communicating with each other within our monolith. We need to make sure that the network is secure. We want to be able to assign an identity to every workload that runs on the network. We want to be able to encrypt that traffic communication. We want to implement zero trust security models. Uh, we want to be able to determine what services can consume other services. We want to be able to route across different versions of our services. We want to be able to implement canary releases and can canary deployments. We want to be able to uh, observe and log and trace everything that's happening in the network. You see, in a, in a monolithic application, if there is a problem, we, we get a stack trace. And the stack trace tells us exactly where the problem was. As we transition to microservices, that's not the case anymore. Uh, we, we, are, we have a stack trace for the individual service, but if something goes wrong in that service connection from one service to another, we don't really know where it went wrong unless we have observability in place. We want to be able to harden our systems, and so we may introduce new patterns like chaos engineering, for example. These are all concerns that we we have every time we make any request over the network. Now, you know, if you look at this from a or organically, you know, from a from a very simple standpoint, we may think, fine, you know, we have to make a request over the network. So the application that I'm building, in this case the monolith, is going to also create functions and, and business logic to handle that network. So we're going to be doing error management, we're going to be doing retries, we're going to be doing um, security handling and enforcing. We're going to be doing all sorts of things as part of our smart client, if you wish, uh, when it makes a request outside the monolith, outside the context of the monolith to another service. The problem with this, uh, as we you know, uh, you know, scale the organization, as we have multiple teams building software, is that different teams are going to be using different technologies, different programming languages, different frameworks, and they're going, they're going to be creating this library in different languages in a very inconsistent way, in a very fragmented way. This is a problem that even with monolithic applications we have. So this is not something that necessarily microservices introduce. Microservices, they in increase the scale. So what microservices do is they take a small problem and they make it much bigger because we have many more services. And if we have fragmentation, uh, we, have, we have much more of that happening across the board. So for example, uh, I was working with a, with a customer, um, a very large global bank, they needed to upgrade their mutual TLS across the organization, but they couldn't. They couldn't because the teams were in charge of building these smart clients um, in a different way. Each one, each one of them built it in a different way. And when, it, when the time came to upgrade the mutual TLS across the organization, because one of the previous TLS protocols was faulty, the organization couldn't just do it. They had to go chase down every team who built each one of these services, each one of these client libraries, and tell them to write more code or fix it to upgrade it. The problem is, as we transition to microservices, we do not want the application teams to manage the network. We want to abstract the network the same way uh, Kubernetes, for example, abstracts the data center. We don't want them to deal directly with the network and secure it and manage it by themselves. Because when they introduce fragmentation, and poor implementations into managing all these service connectivity, guess what happens? We create unreliable applications. And unreliable applications are not good for business. 
ultimately, if we reconnect all of this to the primary goal, which is we want an organization that goes faster, that creates more reliable software, that can attract more customers, that can make existing customers happier. As we go through this transformation, if we do not change how we manage the network within our systems, then the application teams will do it. But the goal of the application teams is to build the application, not to manage the network. Therefore, therefore we're going to be having an inconsistent way of dealing with that service connectivity, which in turn will create unreliability. So what if we instead took a different approach? What if the code that we're writing for managing all of those requests that our services or even monoliths are making to any other service, uh, what if we extract it and we put it into, into a separate executable, into something else that because it's a separate executable, we can now carry over across every programming language and every uh, uh, framework because it's an out of process. It's a, it's a separate process, separate executable. It's an out of process um, you know, implementation. So now if we did that, we could be using this in order to be able to make requests, outbound requests to any other service. And we could write it once and carry it, and carry it over across all the teams and all the applications that we're building. Now, of course, this is only worth it if the latency that this out of process hopping the network is doing is very uh, low. So in order to be able to remove the latency for as much as possible, we want to be able to run our executable that manages all these outbound requests. Uh, we want to be able to run it on the same underlying host or virtual machine or pod as a sidecar container to make sure that the communication between the service and these separate executable is always on local host. Therefore, we want to reduce the latency as much as we can. Of course, the latency is always going to be higher than an in-process network management, but the goal here is to remove fragmentation. So if these our separate executable in this case, it provides so many benefits that overpower the small increase of latency that we're doing on local host, then it's worth it. Now, the nice thing about this is that if we only have it on, um, you know, if we only deploy this library for outbound requests, we can only do some things, but not some other things. For example, one of the things we want to implement is implementing end-to-end -end mutual TLS. In order to implement end-to-end -end mutual TLS, we would like to have this library running on every other service on localhost in order to be able to be enforcing this end-to-end -end connectivity uh, in a secure way without having to re-implement it in our services. So effectively, if we deploy these separate executable next to our services uh, and the separate executables are the contact points every time there is a service wanting to consume another service, now this executable can enforce mutual TLS, can enforce end-to-end -end tracing, and so on and so forth. Now, there is a good news about all of this. And the good news is we don't have to build our own executable, but the industry provides us with open source options that we can adopt um, you know, uh, without having to build it ourselves. And so one of them is, for example, Envoy Proxy. Envoy Proxy is a very lightweight proxy um, that provides a very nice API for dynamic reconfiguration of the policies you want to apply over the network. And we can use Envoy um, as uh, you know, next to our applications and next to our services in order to be able to manage this, fun net this network connectivity. Of course, if you look at the big picture, Envoy in this case will be running alongside every service that we want to manage. Now, what if we want to change the configuration of some of the behaviors that Envoy is enforcing? We don't want to redeploy every time, for example, if, if we want to update mutual TLS or we want to implement a routing strategy, we don't want to redeploy a new configuration to Envoy. We want to be able to dynamically reconfigure Envoy without having to trigger a new redeployment of the entire thing. Um, and so Envoy supports the concept of uh, introducing a, a dependency uh, that's called the control plane, which is the source of truth for all of this configuration. And if we do use a control plane, the control plane is in charge of accepting our configuration and then pushing it to the Envoy proxies. So the control plane becomes the source of truth of all the service connectivity policies that we want to apply. And the control plane is in charge of now pushing that configuration uh, or making that configuration available to Envoy proxies uh, in order to be able to enforce policies on the service to service request. In this 
example, that source of truth is the control plane because it, it, it's the service that we are using to control everything else. And Envoy becomes uh, sits on the data plane, on the execution path of the API of the service-to-service -service requests. The control plane is never on the execution path of the service-to-service -service requests, which means that technically we could be lose connectivity to the control plane, but the service-to-service -service requests will not stop working. Now, if you look at this picture, this is service mesh. Service mesh is not a new thing. Service mesh, it's a bet better implementation of something that our teams have been doing up until now, which is managing the network. And we want them to stop doing that moving forward because as we move to microservices as part of our decentralization transformation, the, the fragmentation that they introduce in managing the network gets bigger and bigger, which ultimately will cause unreliability in our systems. So instead of managing the network, um, you know, instead of allowing the teams to manage the network, what if we tell them, listen, stop managing the network, deploy these uh, separate executables, which is can be Envoy proxy, uh, run it alongside your services, regardless on what programming language, what, you know, the, and, it's, and the services, by the way, can be services that the application teams are creating, but also services that we're deploying ourselves, but we're not building ourselves. For example, we can deploy um, a data plane like Envoy next to a database like MongoDB or Redis or, you know, Oracle, you know, anything really. Anything that makes requests over the network will have these data plane proxy alongside it. And the data plane proxy is in charge of intercepting outbound requests so that we can apply network policies and also receiving inbound requests on, on, the, on the receiving end of, the, of our service-to-service -service connectivity in order to be able to enforce end-to-end um, -end encryption and tracing and mutual TLS and so on. Of course, if you have many, many of these proxies, we want to be able to have a, an easier way, a scalable way to configure them. And, uh, and we introduced the concept of a control plane. And, uh, and this is service mesh. Service mesh is the combination of these data planes and a control plane that allows, them, that allows us to configure them. Of course, uh, at Kong, you know, we're working very deeply with these sort of use cases uh, in the community and in the enterprise. So we did um, an, a release, uh, a project called Kuma, which is a control plane uh, built on top of Envoy that supports Envoy as a data plane proxy that it's quite simple, it's quite portable um, and very simple and easy to use really. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just announced yesterday the donation of Kuma in the, in the CNCF landscape. So you can use Kuma in order to uh, deploy a service mesh with an open uh, and neutral uh, con uh, control plane um, within your systems. Uh, Kuma, it's quite simple to use. Uh, service mesh has been quite hard for many users and many customers of ours. And so we wanted to simplify it. Kuma is a very simple project. Um, it's, a turnkey, it's a turnkey service mesh. We don't have to build an R&D team on top of Kuma to manage Kuma. It just comes out of the box. It's open source, it's neutral. It's part of the CNCF um, landscape as a sandbox project for now. And, um, and you know, on kuma.io, you'll have the chance to get up and running with it quite simple. This is what service mesh is. I'm demystifying service mesh in my presentation today. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the network traffic that we're processing Will, will increase over time. And as we're making that transition from monolith to services to microservices, uh, service mesh really is the end goal of our transformation, where the application teams focus are focused on building the applications and we, the architects, take control of that service connectivity and we control it in a centralized way via the control plane, but then we execute it in a decentralized way on the data plane process. Um, I'm going to wrap up. This is my, we're almost at the end of my presentation. You know, some folks ask me, you know, what's the difference between a gateway and a service mesh? Well, so the gateway really, you know, when we think of a service mesh, we're looking at uh, the low level traffic that our applications are doing to their dependencies. So in an enterprise organization, usually it's very hard to have one service mesh for the entire org. Uh, because we want to, to introduce more isolation between the teams and the applications. We don't want them to depend on the same mesh. And so usually what we're seeing working in production uh, is a service mesh being adopted within the application for all the dependencies that the application is consuming. And then an API gateway is being used across different applications for when we want to onboard either an internal team or an external team or client to consume our system. You know, the API gateway also does not provide any dependency whatsoever in a sense that uh, and we don't have to 
change anything in our services to use a gateway. We deploy it in as a centralized ingress, uh, as a third party on its own architectural layer, if you wish. Whereas with service mesh, we have to change the existing services to be able to deploy our decentralized sidecars. And the decentralized sidecars then have to have access to our control plane. So for example, if we want to allow, if we want to allow uh, somebody to build a mobile app on top of our APIs, we cannot use a service mesh because we don't want, we cannot tell them to run a sidecar. And most importantly, we don't want their sidecar to enter and talk to our control plane. We want to have a gateway as an abstraction layer on top of our services that could, that can enforce user governance and can enforce the onboarding of, for example, a mobile app when consuming APIs in our applications. And the gateway can also be used for enabling a mesh, uh, enabling requests even within the organization to exit one mesh and perhaps enter another mesh. Of course, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the CTO of Kong. You know, we work with the open source community uh, a lot, and our projects and products are open source. So all of this full life cycle, if you wish, service mesh and API gateway is completely abstracted away if you're using Kuma as a service mesh and if you're using Kong as the API gateway. So where we're trying to make all of this very simple for the users, so that so that you know we we can allow them to focus on thing, on things that matter, which is okay, what policies I want to enforce and how I want to expose my APIs. To recap, uh, we're transitioning uh, into a new era of software, and we've been doing that for a while now. We're transitioning from monolithic to microservices, and as we do that, we introduce more connectivity because microservices talk to each other over the network, as opposed to a monolith that talks to um, different uh, aspects uh, of our. Uh, uh, you know, different parts of our systems uh, within the CPU. Now, of course, if we introduce more connectivity, we introduce the network. The network can be quite painful to manage and secure and control, and we want to have something that does it for us. And that something is service mesh. The so service mesh, uh, really, it's a better way of managing the network. Uh, and if you wish, it's almost an evolution of our smart clients that we've been building up until now uh, when it comes to, to managing the service connectivity. And that's it for today. Thank you so much. I believe there is perhaps a small Q&A session. Yeah, yeah, we have three minutes for Q&A. Um, uh, some people are asking, um, uh, are ser when service meshes are actually uh, relevant? And, and I would just compliment you know, uh, uh, the question by, do you need them first to have experienced microservices and when microservices is not enough to go to service mesh or can you go directly to service meshes? Uh, you can go directly to service meshes. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you something. I suggest going to service mesh first before going to microservices, because by the time we transition to microservices, if we already have service mesh in place, the network is already taken care of for us. We don't have to worry about transitioning that network management anymore. So it's one less thing to transform as part of the overall monolithic to microservices transformation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. And so for the people who think that, I think it was someone from Netflix who said that if you think you need service mesh, you don't need service mesh because it has to be a clear mandate in a sense that it needs to be obvious, right? If it's not, uh, do you agree with that? Let's uh, see, uh, connectivity becomes more painful the more we do it, right? Uh, and so if, if we feel like we don't have control on how the service connectivity is, is being managed, and if I am, for example, uh, an architect in an enterprise organization, and I want to take control, control back of the service connectivity that the organization is doing, then as an architect, I, I cannot uh, allow the teams to keep managing the network by themselves because it's not their job and it's not their goal. So whenever I feel like I want to control the connectivity stack, or whenever I feel like that the current implementations are causing problems and unreliability, you know, that's probably the time to start thinking about you know, abstracting away the service connectivity from the application teams. And service mesh is perfect for that because while it centralizes how I control the connectivity, it still, it centralizes the control, but it decentralizes the execution at runtime by using decentralized sidecars. So you have all the benefits of control and all the benefits of low latency thanks to the decentralized data plane model. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, it was uh, with really nice slides, actually. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And yeah, uh, so if people want to know more about service meshes, they can contact uh, Marco and his team uh, directly. Thank you. Have a good one.
Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. And now uh, we continue our track uh, with a, a topic that a lot of people talk about, which is, uh, let's say, contract driven development or collaboration driven development. How to decide? Can we do both? Right. So, uh, and we have a, a, a speaker for, from Smartbird, uh, Aliana Inzana, who is senior director and, uh, of product management, who will talk about it uh, to us. So, we're really glad to have her. And yes, hello, Aliana. Uh, Hello, how are you asking, doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, doing well. Just asking you to share your screen, mm -hmm. uh, which is the main challenge of uh, digital conferences. And uh, and after that, we'll be able to listen to your talk. All right, let's see if we can get the screen sharing going. That works. We see your screen, we hear you. The stage is yours for 25 minutes. Thank you, Aliana. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Mehdi. Um, and, and welcome, everyone, to uh, our talk. You'll forgive me the sort of... Um, you know, uh, a dad joke, I guess you could say, of the title. Um, I did, in fact, come up with it on American Father's Day. Um, so today we're going to talk about, in the API space, a lot of the conversation around contract-driven development has centered on the question, did we build the API right? But by using the contract as a foundation for our common understanding of the API, we can answer not only that question, but the equally important and uh, ever so much more elusive, did we build the right API? So in today's talk, we'll be discussing how API specifications and consumer-driven contracts can form the basis of cross-team collaboration in delivering quality services. Now, we have limited time together, right? So I'm not going to be delving into other techniques to build the right API from the get-go, like event storming or behavior-driven development. Job theory, these are all part of the process. But as a product manager, I can tell you that there's a fairly decent chance you use one, even all of these techniques, and without the right user acceptance testing, when the API is out there in production, it may not actually meet the needs of its users. So I want you to think back to the last time that you created a new API. Now, assuming you followed design first principles, it's likely that the exercise started with perhaps some devs, an architect, maybe an expert or two, and a whiteboard. This is going back a few months now. So you have to sort of hope the experts understand enough about APIs, that the architects and the engineers, they get the domain, that the whiteboard has markers that works, that someone can find that one eraser that's the only eraser that's on the floor for all of those conference rooms. And then someone, let's say it's the architect, they go, they take a picture of the whiteboard for all of us to delete later and goes back to her desk and creates a specification. From this point, there are a myriad of ways that this exercise can go pear-shaped. We have experienced probably a few of them. To consider all of them, well, this could be a week-long course. So to focus in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to pick some of my favorite ways that design first can go off the rails and how to make your contracts the focus of collaboration to bring you back again. So let's start with the first obvious challenge. You aren't practicing design first. Perhaps there are legacy services, or maybe you're in that first uncomfortable leg of the design first journey, where you're taking stock of the code first APIs around you and wondering if the generated documentation is even worth evaluating. Yes, it, it will be, at least. In the transition from code first to design first, the contract, however it's generated, is a bridging solution. The initial foray could be centralizing contract management or adoption of the contract as a source of truth not only for API discovery and documentation, but for testing and for validation of the API in the DevOps process. And whether or not the contract is considered a build artifact or a design artifact, in the ultimate analysis, whether code or design first principles were in play, the API was created in recognition of a need. The next challenge is a little more abstract. See, design first is not exactly contract first, not if you consider that initial sketch of the specification as an immutable contract between the provider and its consumers. For design first to be effective, to deliver on its promise, design must predate and inform the specification. So with the pictures from your whiteboard, 
you return to your desk, you write up the specification. Now we have a specification, um, maybe some business requirements. What's next? Do you just build it? If we were architecting houses instead of services, then we would hope the architect knows how to formulate an executable blueprint. And I would absolutely agree that it is important for the builders, the construction engineers, to follow those plans on where the pipes go or which of those things is a, is a load bearing wall. These can all be correct and built to spec and still not work for the people for whom you're building. The same is true of services. If you don't use that specification as a foundation for collaboration, if you don't arrive at that communal understanding of what the API does and how it does it, it's just like executing on a blueprint without considering how the building will be used. Again, the means to solicit feedback from this broader community lies at the intersection of tools and the specification. Through the specs duality of machine and human readableness, you don't have to ask for comments on some gnarly looking back of the napkin specification, but rather using API mocking or virtualization, you can create from the spec a living example of your API. Users, partners, Documentation writers, they could all interact with your API before a single line of code is written and give you feedback. And the best news about this is that because that feedback came early enough in the process, you'll actually incorporate it into the specification and then ultimately the code. Keeping design in design first requires engaged listening to your consumers, not always to what they ask you for, but to what they do in your API sandbox. And with a holistic look at design from engineers, subject matter experts, SREs, security partners, you name it, there is a far greater chance of building the right API by virtue of the lightning fast design revs that are enabled by specifications. For the majority of APIs, this kind of collaboration is not a one-time thing. It occurs over time, and it involves a seriously non-trivial number of people. So you code the API, and as a step, maybe it's the final step, the API build is run against a spec for conformance, but that testing is more like um, a one-time check. It's not an ongoing process. So what happens when it's time to evolve the API? You have to iterate. And it has been known to occasionally happen that subsequent revisions, the API build falls out of conformance with the specification. And this can be a real problem. So again, imagine you're an architect, uh, the kind that builds houses this time, and you never check to see if the house that the crew was building aligned to your blueprint. What could the impact be if then you plan an addition to the structure without knowing that the construction engineers moved the load bearing wall? The consequences could be disastrous, but minimally, time will be wasted and there will be rework. Instead of performing manual checks of endpoints and comparing them against documentation, or even running a one-time test between the build and the contract, because specifications are designed to be machine readable, it's relatively straightforward to automate producer-side contract tests and add them directly into your build pipelines. So now every pull request can trigger a contact, a, a contract test. And builds that are out of conformance with the specification, they won't be promoted into production. If style guides and rules have been incorporated into your design system, and then obviously followed in the design, then the contract test can also confirm that governance was followed. Consumers of the API benefit because no one really enjoys working with poorly documented or wholly inaccurate APIs. And the specification can be treated like another piece of code. So similar workflows can be established with a version control system. So contract-driven development from this angle looks a lot like test-driven development more broadly. A producer side contract describes how functionality uh, will be added to the API. When that change of the spec causes the build pipeline tests to flip bread, the engineering team is alerted to pick up the new work. By executing on new code, they then flip those contract tests back to green. 
But the added benefit of integrating such tests into your CI-CD pipeline is the better alignment of your dev organization. Lag time between committing a change to the spec and engineering picking up that work is shortened. And no matter who's initiating the PR, alignment between documentation and build can be confirmed. You know you're building the API right. Maintaining the connection between the spec and live service is an important aspect of evolving your API. But the producer side contract test can also alert teams when there's disengagement on API collaboration, right? Because a failure downstream happens when designers and developers are not in agreement about how the API should behave. So though the main purpose I would argue is to know that you built the API right, contract tests can also provide an early warning system for when the API may have veered from the path of building the right API. Because at that point, the specification is no longer a good foundation for describing what you're going to do next. So now let's meet your other contracts and talk a little bit about consumer-driven contract testing. So far, we focused on things that are within our control as API providers. Now we are going into the unknown and discussing the whole point of providing APIs, consumers. Whether they're internal to our organizations or basically anyone on the internet who knows how to call a public API, consumers are both the intended target of your API's content and also one of the chief reasons that design first is so darn hard to maintain sometimes. Consumers make our lives difficult in a number of ways. First of all, they use your APIs and they use them in ways they largely do not share with you. Even the best telemetry can't tell you all that they do or use within the API. Transactions can occur outside of the observed window, for example, and those won't be documented. Consumers cause security problems. I mean, like that API, it doesn't just hack itself. In certain architectural patterns, event-driven or messaging for one, they can be entirely anonymous and unknown to you. That is until you change something. And then they'll make themselves heard with rollback requests, hot fixes, y'all know the drill. They use your API wrong, even after all that beautiful documentation too. If there's an endpoint out there, they're consuming it. Even if it's that one endpoint you maybe should have deprecated from the crazy monolithic data model that you theoretically were gonna neaten when you moved it into microservices. But hey, you know what, Cons human beings, essentially conservative, and you know, you might have needed it. You can have the world's most well-designed API with brilliant interactive and polished documentation, but as an API producer, you can only know your world and the content you create. You cannot know the hearts, the minds, and the implementation details of your consumers without a contract. The consumer-driven contract test is another way to answer, did you build the API right? Only this time, the API provider is not the one asking that question. A consumer-driven contract is a sort of formalized request that you stop breaking someone else's stuff. And even for internal APIs, your audience can be considerable. Picture for a moment, the absolute rabbit's warren of microservices that your organization is required to maintain. And they keep multiplying until your service architecture diagram vaguely resembles the Death Star. Oh, wait, not this one, this one. Much scarier, isn't it? There isn't just one consumer. But in certain cases, the extent of your API's audience can be known, particularly in a microservices architecture and internal APIs. <clears throat> now, please multiply all those consumers by the ridiculous number of ways you can potentially break something. Because there's just so many ways of breaking stuff, 
The provider-based spec contract tests don't cover all the ways you can break an integration, especially in the implementation details outside of the spec. You could change the structure of a response, for example, um, or change an object's properties. What if you added a description to the movie object? It could increase the payload size of a call for movies by quite a lot. Then there's error handling. Again, depending on how a consumer has implemented their business logic, producing an error um, could be, or altering the error type, or even the error message, depending on what they've done, that could be a breaking change. There's the event type and, and the event payload. So changing an event type in an event-driven version of messaging, um, it, it's sort of like messing with the, the REST resource. Consumers will need to listen for the new type, and if they don't know about that, they're gonna miss events. The event payload, very similar to changing the structure of a REST response, consumers implement all sorts of validation and also routing based on event payloads. Therefore, even additive changes have the potential for breaking. Rate limiting. Um, the way that the customer is invoking your service may need to change because you've decided to, to rate limit. Um, worst case scenario, you know, maybe they'll even have to pay you for the service or upgrade their subscription. And then content distribution, like, um, <clears throat> moving the API behind a CDN, then uh, trying to figure out where did those new headers come from? I can actually give you an example from a, a customer of ours. They were using SmartBear's uh, API virtualization tool uh, to record an existing service, and then they were asserting against the responses from that service. And they couldn't figure out where these new headers were coming from, and it never had been a problem before. They thought it was our recorder, so they called customer care, but we couldn't replicate the issue. It turns out they didn't know the, the whole team didn't know, but their, their ops team had actually moved their API behind a CDN and the added headers, which were actually bumping out the header that our client was looking for to do routing was part of the CDN's geographic routing. This all goes to say that if you wait until your API is in production or you're doing a final pass of tests before deployment, it's entirely likely that you've waited a little bit too long. So instead of testing against the deployment candidate, a good method is to create a virtual service and then run those consumer-driven contract tests against the mock and incorporate the feedback into your design cycle. There's an additional plus, and it's one that not a lot of folks talk about, but if you know that the consumers of your API are providing up-to-date contract tests that are comprehensive, and that those test assets are managed centrally in your version control system, so you're not falling behind, then it could be possible to further simplify your API by deleting unused endpoints. SmartBear did a customer survey, survey, and one of the jobs to be done where users had the absolute most difficulty was knowing when part or even all of an API could be sunset. So the contract-driven tests can assist us there too. In closing, the act of designing should really be an ongoing collaboration, which is facilitated by the specification as teams iterate. The specification can bridge code and a design first approaches. You can use the spec to perform user acceptance testing before you even write a line of code. If you keep design in design first, so that it's not design first only at first, by integrating the producer-driven contract tests into your build pipelines, and if you use the consumer-driven contract as a means of understanding the impact of any change, by using these tools, you can be more confident that you have both built the API right and also built the right API. Thank you very much, Elena. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have a we have some minutes for questions. Uh, um, one question about like, it seems we can handle a lot of the life cycle through uh, through the specs. Mm -hmm. What 
in your opinion, what should stay out of it, right? What should stay out of it? Should stay out of the spec or should stay out of the conversation? Uh, no, no. <laughs> what, no, what should stay out of the spec? What's the human processes mm -hmm. that can be still out of the spec and, and still be relevant, uh, you know, uh, to support contract-driven development? Absolutely. So I think one of the biggest challenges of, of engi any engineering organization, honestly, is to overcome those barriers of communication that are inherent throughout all our organizations. What I think is interesting, when you have centralized tools and centralized content like specifications or uh, a version control system for your code, it's not a it's not a fix everything. But what it does is it allows for the means of collaboration. Same like having a Slack group allows a group to communicate a lot easier than they would if they were all uh, dispersed around various offices and, and using email. Um, so I think in terms of what the specifications currently cover, um, I think it is important that implementation details are optional. Um, you can see this kind of in uh, the async API world. Um, I have always been a very big fan of knowing as a testing vendor, like, all right, well, what method are you using for back pressure on that API? And, you know, I think uh, Fran, it's pretty standard argument to me is like, oh, that, that is an implementation detail. I'm like, all right, but specs are also extendable. And so you could have a vendor extension to a spec that allows you to document something which is important for your organization, but may not necessarily be something that is broadly accepted as part of a specification. Yeah, we have a question from Jason McDonald. How do how do the consumer driven contract come into existence? Do consumers write them? Do producers build them for monitoring? Yeah, if you can remind uh, this part uh, for Jason. Sure. So the answer is actually can be both. Um, when you're creating sort of the functional performance and other types of tests for your API, you can kind of fake a consumer. So that's one way of going about it. Um, but the thing that we're seeing in some larger organizations, and, and quite frankly, I think it's a practice we'd like to foster, is when you have people who are sort of, they're trying to isolate their own microservice, let's say. Um, they're building tests that sort of validate that your microservice is actually behaving perfectly, um, and they are testing their system. If you do that, you're actually creating a test asset that could be shared more broadly. And if it is shared more broadly, and if you accept that this test validates that your microservice is working, even with its dependencies, then those dependencies can kind of pick up the test asset and say, all right, well, now we can use it too. So again, it's about how the ecosystem enables that collaboration. Yeah. Uh, last question, maybe about like the uh, how to onboard the business into uh, collaborating to the specs. Like, uh, where? Yeah. You yeah, very gently, very carefully. <laughs> um, you know, I I think the the best examples sometimes come out of the transitions from code first to design first. Um, it, it's it's a it's a change. It's a way of life change. And I think one of the best ways of going about doing that is. When you're having conversations in the abstract, it's very hard to pinpoint a source of, let's say, unease, right? If you're trying to decide what to do. When you have something to react to, uh, particularly something that could be interactive, right? It's much easier to say, oh, I get that, that does this. You know, words can be interpreted in different ways, but when you're interacting with a physical thing, you know what the intention was. And knowing intention is a great way of kind of driving that collaborative cycle because understanding it means you can give good feedback, feedback that's actionable. Having feedback that's actionable then is, is sort of drives that quality story all the way around. Yeah, thank you, Alina. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it was really insightful and, uh, and also the artwork were, were, was quite nice. And I think a lot of people can take uh, a lot of good advice from, uh, from this about how they can collaborate while doing contract-driven development, I think it's extremely important. So uh, yeah, and if you want to know more about like uh, contract-driven development and about testing, uh, SmartBear ha have a, um, has a booth at the event in the expo, so you can go there and ask some questions. Thank you very much, Aliana. You can uh, unlock your screen. And Thank now we're moving that to host our next uh, speaker, uh, uh, Rani Mitra. So I'm really glad to have uh, Rani on stage. 
uh, because uh, Ronnie has clearly ha was at the first API days in 2012. That's true. Right? So, yeah. Uh, and let's say his uh, mindset and his uh, knowledge uh, with some others, but uh, really where are uh, pillars of the industry, right? About where, uh, yeah, and his humility too, right? But, but yeah, so really advocating a good use of APIs of microservices over these years. And uh, and yes, yeah, so really glad to have you here, Ronnie. I know the effort it was to make that talk, right? But thank yeah. you very much for uh, for this. And so you have 25 minutes and the stage is yours uh, uh, for your talk uh, about going borderless uh, with uh, APIs. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we're really glad to have you. All right. Let me just find the button like every single speaker has had to. One second. Application window. All right. Can I can I assume that you can see that? Yeah, I'm going to. Mehdi, just jump in if, if we can't. Uh, as with every Happy Days event, uh, I agree to do a talk. And then Mehdi says, what's the talk about? And uh, I say, I don't know. And then I come up with the title. And eventually, I have to come up with a talk to go with it. And this year, uh, I thought, you know, there's, there's this thing that has been an itch that I've been scratching, which is kind of a shift in the way we we look at strategy. Uh, so I've called this going borderless, and we'll dive into what that means in a second. Uh, first, I just want to introduce myself a little bit better in case, you know, we've never met. Uh, so I'm Ronnie. Uh, I've been lucky enough to write a few books, and I'm really excited about this book. I'm working on this with Arakli. It's called Microservices Up and Running. Uh, I'm excited not just about the, the animal, which is a fantastic animal to get from O'Reilly. Uh, the first book I ever did for them, we got a snail. This is a huge, huge step up from that. Uh, but I'm excited about this one because it's really practical. Uh, it takes you from the point of if you don't have a microservices architecture, you go through the book and by the end of it, you've built a, a complete thing, at least one. So you'll be able to say, hey, yeah, I've built, I built one of these. The talk today though, there's aspects of microservices in it, but but I really wanted to address, you know, a point of view, something I'm seeing in terms of us and how we look at APIs and, and API strategy. Um, and a lot of it comes from, you know, over the last year and a little bit, I've been working for this, this fantastic company, Publicis Sapient, uh, as a consultant. So Publicis Sapient is a, is a digital agency. We do digital transformation. Uh, I've been working with a lot of, of big banks. And we're starting to see kind of a change in how businesses are operating and how they perceive APIs and where maybe the next opportunity is. You know, Mehdi mentioned I was at the first API event. Um, and I've been in this stuff for a long time, it feels like. Right? Going back, even predating SOAP, I think a lot of us have been. And, and if you think back to that time, you know, in the early 2000s when you had SOAP start to emerge, there was a, a, an optimism about using the web. Right? So we would develop web services. They would be SOAP-based. Uh, but it would give us the ability to use this web that we had been using as humans to look at documents, to browse, uh, in a way that you know we wouldn't just have an email client in the browser, but we'd be able to make our software talk to each other. And so we got those standards, those those highly typed standards from, from Microsoft and Dave Weiner and eventually IBM getting involved. And they also did things like implement UDDI registries, right? They gave us ways of describing services, of finding services in an automated way. But really, if you look at it, what ended up happening, the real impact was we got APIs inside of enterprises and inside of companies. And that was a huge, huge step forward. Uh, it meant that we could start to take our business functions and wrap them up and you could invoke them. And we all started doing that. And then somewhere around the 2010s, uh, someone started calling these things web APIs, or at least that's around when I heard about it. And it was so confusing because I thought APIs meant something and now I was being told APIs meant something else. But the crux of it was that it was an embracing of the, the, the DNA of the web, right? The, the protocol that made it work, HTTP. So whereas before, if you were making a SOAP interface, you were agnostic of the web. You could send a SOAP message over email. 
now you were saying, no, no, this is about HTTP and we're going to use HTTP to help software talk to software. Again, there was this, uh, this optimism about how we could use the web. If you actually look at the agenda of the, the first Paris Appy Days, which, uh, by the way, was in person, people gathered in a, in a physical room for that one. Uh, you'll see that a lot of the talks were about openness. Uh, there was this optimism about the democracy of APIs that you know companies could start building these things and publishing them, and we could build interesting and engaging applications on top of it. Uh, it's around that time that a lot of people, you know, including myself, we were going around and telling companies that there was this opportunity here that you could take advantage of, that maybe your data is very valuable or you can become an API business because it turns out there's an economy and you can make this thing and find a new revenue stream. And all you have to do is uh, publish an API in the right way as a product. It kind of died down though. And the, the way it died down was we had companies who were championing this idea of public and open APIs, and they started to claw back. Uh, the companies that told us that uh, there was all this innovation potential and you could just release an API started making their APIs private or partner oriented. Uh, the large enterprises who started building APIs, uh, it started to look like it was more of an experiment than a strategy. But we ended up with more APIs. And I'd say the biggest result, the biggest thing that came out of this era was suddenly developers mattered, right? We take that for granted now. But if you look at this era, at the beginning of this era, no one was really talking about them in the same way. But now we say developer experience in DX, like it's a term we've always used, right? The truth is before it was just a bunch of people in Microsoft when they were developing IDEs saying DX. So developers got a seat at the table. And now anything we're building, we're talking about developers. If you go in a room and talk to business people, they're talking about developers, a fundamental shift. And now we're in this era of microservices and the microservices era is a bit different because it's this, this, this time where we're focusing on optimization. If you look at what the architecture is, it's taking a lot of what works on the web at scale and applying it inside. And the companies we emulate are the huge ones, the mega companies, you know, the Googles, the Amazons, who have so much tech and so much breadth and so many people on working on so many things, and they can do it at great speed, but with this massive power and base. So that's where we are. What's interesting to me, though, is this is a very API-centric view of what's happened. But if you take that lens away, um, if we stop focusing on the APIs, if not everything's about APIs, what we find out is that you know there has been all this stuff happening. Uh, here's the statistics I pulled up uh, just today: fifteen thousand SaaS companies in the world. Now I can't speak to the truthfulness of this stat, but it's a big number. There's a lot of people who have been building software and putting it on the web, right? Now what they haven't done is focused on putting APIs on the web. But what they built are companies that operate on the web. These are products. The other interesting thing that's happened is the value of APIs has gone down. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, in the early 2000s, if you publish software on the web, people might get excited about it. The fact that you provided an API and I can make a call from my software to call yours was a pretty unique and interesting thing. Uh, a lot of companies were doing it. They were doing it with XML and they were doing it with SOAP and it was a really cool feature. When we get to the 2010s and we're talking a lot more about APIs and why they're important, APIs start to become a, a utility function, a, a thing you should have. And when I'm evaluating what software I'm going to use, if you have an API, I appreciate that. And I might value you a little bit more than your competitors. So it starts to become a, a linear function, something that you're not going to surprise me. I'm not delighted or excited that you have it, but I'm interested. Uh, and I would say now we're at this point where uh, you better have an API, right? If you're going to put a product on the web and operate as a SaaS company, I assume you have an API. And in fact, if you don't, then I'm going to score points against you. 
So we have this combination of a massive amount of SaaS, most of it API enabled because APIs have become hygiene, which means this, this world we were talking about kind of exists, right? There is a network of services available, but what it's not is a network of APIs, right? It's not about me going to an API catalog or API registry and finding this thing. It's not about speaking to developers. These are business products for business people that are API enabled. The API isn't the value, the API is the channel. But that doesn't mean it's not valuable. Right? We've been starting to increase our dependencies over time. And this is another reason the timing seems right for maybe a shift in where we invest and how we look at things. Right? We've been giving away more and more of our stack. Uh, if you're a business, you want to focus on your core capabilities, like Eric Evans talks about in DDD. Focus on the things that give you advantage. What are your differentiators? If you're Dropbox, you probably don't give away your storage capability right, to a cloud provider. If you're a bank, you probably don't care as much about optimizing how you run virtual machines. And so we've started to become more dependent on vendors to do these things. And a natural next step is to start to increase our dependence on capability providers, right? This makes sense. If I can focus on my core capabilities and I can use really good software around it, maybe I can move faster, release better software, release better products and improve experiences. And that's kind of what I mean by borderless. If you, if you started to build systems, assuming you had access to all that software, because I know we do use external services today, but what if you designed your solutions this way? If I just assume that I'm always going to use other people's services outside of my core domain, what would your architecture look like? What would your business look like? How would you run it differently? And how would you change how you compete? This is starting to become a new normal, right? How do you start to do less, but provide more by increasing what you depend on? So another way to say this is, you know, we went around and we've been talking about how building APIs is really the key to strategy. And it still is in a lot of ways. There's plenty of opportunity if you build APIs. But it might be that now is the time to focus more on the consumption. What would happen if you embraced a borderless, a borderless mindset uh, and became better at consuming? So it's not just about I can consume APIs. The competitive advantage comes from doing it better than anyone else. Turns out that that's hard. And that's why there's opportunity. Connecting to one API is, is almost trivial, right? And if it wasn't almost trivial, then what are the last like 10 years been about, because that's what it was. We're going to make it easier. We're going to be developer centric. We're focusing on usability. But what it's not is, is compounding or scalable. So if I write code, if I build a system to depend on one API, it doesn't help me connect to any other APIs. There's a lot of things like that in our industry and in our time in technology at the moment when it comes to connectivity. If you look at the history of talks now, Happy Days has been going for a long time. There's a lot of people at these events talking about how to solve this kind of problem, right? How do we make the system more charitable for dependencies? How do we make it so that loose coupling is more of a thing? For whatever reason, you know, the market isn't really listening. No one is getting an advantage by being more interchangeable. So the only way to really take advantage of this is to take on some of that cost yourself, right? So the opportunity is we have a, we have a world where APIs are, are a little bit brittle, a little bit coupled. What can you do to build a system where you can leverage all that capability and do it in a way where the real advantage comes from swapping in parts in and out? Well, it turns out you have to address some specific challenges. The first thing is engagement. What we don't have is a world where I can, through machines or through algorithms, pick capabilities I want to use. 
determine costs and onboard and engage. That doesn't really exist. There's versions of that world that people have described, but it's not here yet. So what you need to do, if you want to be borderless, is really strengthen your human capability. here. You need to assess the market. You need to have a map of the ecosystem. You need to know who the players are. You need to have strong contract and procurement functions. The good news is most of us do if we're operating the enterprise. But there's a nuance here. If you go to a procurement person and you tell them about this idea, you say, what we want to do is actually start engaging with a host of partners. There's 15 of them. And we think these 15 partners are going to lead us into a future where we're more profitable. The response you're going to get is, you know, is there some way we could just engage with one of them? And that one partner could pick the other 14. Because from a commercial perspective, this is very difficult. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of liability. It's a lot of work. So just like we do when we build a technology system, we need to make this easier from an integration perspective and from an interop perspective. So the goal here, when you're thinking about engagement with the outside world and capabilities, is how can you bound these relationships? So you can tell your procurement teams and your buying teams and your partner teams, each engagement is its own thing. And when we change the function or we switch suppliers over here, we're going to encapsulate that impact so that you don't have to change. And if this sounds familiar, it should, right? It's the same kind of reasoning we talk about for microservices. I think there was a guy who made a law about communication and systems or something like that. The other thing we have to accept and address is that we can't change someone else's API. So I'm using all of these services. And again, what they're selling is val a value, a capability, what they're not selling me is an API. So their APIs may not be as modern or as loosely coupled or in the style that I want. So we're going to have to protect ourselves. We're going to have to invest in capability to create the loose coupling we want, to create the system that we want. And here, we can adopt a lot of the stuff that works within a microservices system. I can start to abstract an API. Essentially, I can take your API as your capability provider and create a version of it that works for me and translate between the two. Right In the domain-driven design world, you might call that an anti-corruption layer, where we've identified these are the subdomains. And you know, in order to protect our domain model and our data model, we're going to put something in between us. The trick here is to figure out what those boundaries are. So understanding your core domain, understanding what the subdomains are, turns out to be important because this is how you bound your change. Right? When the capability provider's model changes, you're going to have to change one of these anti-corruption layer components. Which ones? The other thing you'll need to do is introduce some kind of operations and testing capability just like you would for your own services, so that you understand when external things are changing, but you treat them like they're internal, so you build all of that visibility and observability and change management right into it. The other problem you'll hit is that, by design, we don't want the providers talking to each other, because that's going to make our relationships more difficult. It will just make our world more complicated. So instead, we're going to have to pay that cost. It means that we need to start building a choreography layer or an orchestration layer or something that weaves the whole thing together. And there's lots of different ways to implement that. Uh, the big decision here is, are you going to decentralize your choreography or your, your orchestration? Are you going to drop a BPM style product in here? Are you going to do something that's a bit of a hybrid? It looks like it's a BPM system, but you deploy it and it becomes a decentralized implementation. However you do it, the point is you're going to need it because you need something that weaves all this together. Outside of the build of your core domain, this is really the, the code to allow you to have access to the supporting domains in a way that helps you. And then you hit the big problem, just like you did for microservices, which is the data. Now you've got data all over the place. There's no easy way to understand what's happening. 
every provider is essentially a black box with the data uh, encapsulated and hidden within the system. It turns out that putting data at the center of this kind of architecture is step one. Uh, you're going to need to capture things like event logs. You'll need a way to pull all that data in from other places, normalize it, clean it up, transform it, so that you can do the things that are valuable, like uh, getting reports, uh, creating audit reports for regulators, uh, and even be able being able to get some insight right, by having data that's useful. There are lots of different ways of doing this. But the key thing is we need those constraints. The constraint of the capability providers don't talk to each other, they talk to us so that we can start to capture interactions, message data, uh, and business data in a way that's useful for us. That might also involve not being the system of record or the store. It could be that this is just a view and I pull it when needed. But however you implement it, this thing has to be there. And it has to be really at the heart of whatever you build. And then the last challenge you face is that the whole thing is so complicated, it's, it's difficult to understand. So you're going to have to put something on top of it. Um, for us, of course, that means APIs. So we want to have APIs for the user experience and APIs for third parties to use this platform or for ecosystems to use it. The main thing we're trying to do is, is hide the complexity so that someone who's using this function doesn't need to know that there's 13 services that come from outside our organization, some microservices that weave it together in, in a data store. What they actually want to do is just onboard a customer. Beyond that, you're going to need consoles, ways for both businesses and, and tech to see what's happening. Uh, and this turns out to be a challenge. The, the lean version of this is you can point them to a distributed or decentralized set of consoles. Hey, if you're looking for CRM data, you'll have to log into the, the CRM console. And that can be a starting point. Uh, eventually, with more investment, you can start to create a single pane of glass, uh, but that takes work. But then the last and most intriguing thing to me is to start changing the way we talk about service catalogs. Uh, if you think about it, when people say things like service registry and catalogs and management, they tend to think about a catalog of maybe APIs in the channel. These are the ones I can use to do something with your system. Or we think about uh, APIs inside, right? So from a registry perspective, all the ones in our enterprise. But what if the, the, the catalog was just services with some metadata about where it lives? So what we get is a view of APIs that we can build things with. And that includes the ones we own, the ones we use, and the ones we could use. Then you can start to really expand how you look at the world. Ultimately, the, the architecture I'm describing, that's a microservices architecture, right? But it's a microservices architecture that pretends that someone else's services are, are our own. And that's what I mean by borderless. I'm not saying there's no borders. I mean it in that same kind of way that uh, whoever started calling serverless, serverless. It's this perception, this point of view. How could you optimize a system where we try and build it in a way where we take advantage of other people's services? Right. So if that's interesting to you, these are the kinds of systems uh, we're building. So get in touch if, if this is something you feel like you need. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you and we can find out if we can help. Thanks. Hi, Ronnie. Thank you very much for, for that talk. Uh, we see some some uh, comments and questions. Right. So do you are you saying that the future of growth or potential is about is on the consumer, not on the provider side anymore? I think we've talked about building and providing a lot. And of course, there's still potential there. What I'm saying is there's a new opportunity here that we should pay attention to. And it might mean that if classically your target market is not developers and you've done what you need from an API perspective, then there's an opportunity here to invest in something that would give returns.
is it a kind of a, a web of let's say uh, corporate APIs that we're that we're trying to implement? I think I think the description I I showed you here might be. Um, but essentially, it's still it's still a web of services, right? Now these turned out to be like services you have to pay for. What I can imagine though is if you start going down this road, what I hope is it could lead us to the kind of more open web of APIs that that we imagine. Because what we need to do is start greasing this wheel, so that there's actual uh, motivation, right, to create services that are easier to consume, easier to engage with, easier to onboard with, and easier to use. Yeah, that makes sense. But what do we need to go to the next step? Is it about standards? Is it about companies working together? I, I don't have an answer for that yet. I don't know. Uh, what I do know is there is a piece of work that's immediately in front of anyone who wants to engage with the system. And that piece of work is you know, hiding some of the, the things that are missing, filling in some of those gaps in interoperability. Where it goes from there, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's a great uh, a vision that you share here. And a lot of people actually are trying to make APIs more discoverable and more integrable. Yeah. Uh, and yes, yeah, so they're trying to find a path to that uh, value proposition, but it's not easy. It's not easy, let's say, uh, like that. Absolutely. So it was very inspiring. Thank you, Rani, for all, all the right. work you went to it. And yes, yeah. and uh, yeah, have a, good, uh, have, a, have a good one. Thanks, Benny. So uh, for uh, the next talk before the break, uh, we will talk about um, with the March chess hire uh, about when to manage microservices as a mesh or as API. So we continue on the topic uh, of uh, yeah, uh, web meshes, web of meshes, uh, mesh of meshes, right? And you can do uh, any inter iteration of, of this. Uh, and uh, what's the relation uh, uh, with uh, uh, with APIs? Definitely, I, I see some comments like uh, API without borders. Yeah, we can launch a movement actually. Uh, <laughs> API without borders. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, we're waiting for Mark to join. Maybe. Yes, Mark is here. He's coming on the stage like a digital walking. Uh, yeah. Hello, Mark. How are you? Hi. How are you doing, Meta? Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again. You, so, you have to work on your tongue twisters. The web of meshes is managed by a service mesh. Say that 10 times quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's hard for me with my uh, French accent. But let's go for your 25 minutes uh, with a topic uh, that interests a lot of people uh, from our uh, Atani survey. Are you able to share your screen on the third button? Does your laptop recognize uh, the application? And then we are up to deliver the message. Let's see. No. Is this in the slide share mode? Yeah, this is. We can see your screen. We can hear you. The stage is yours. Enjoy your time and stage with our community. Thank you, Mark. For well, thank you first, Mehdi, and to all the organizers so much for putting together this fantastic event. It's uh, great to be back in the same virtual room as all of the, the great API thought leaders out there. And I, it seems that we get even more of us together when we're virtual than when we all have to travel to one location in some place of the world. So it's great to be here. What I'd like to do today is to talk about microservices. It's a really hot topic right now and builds on, carries on from the theme of APIs that has driven the API Days conference series for so many years now. One of the challenges that we often hear from customers is that uh, they, they ask themselves, well, when I'm managing a mesh and I have service mesh to as a management approach, does that make API management redundant? Can I manage everything as a service mesh or should, is it too early for service mesh? Should I actually be using API management? So th this talk is to give a bit of a guide on how to think about this problem. Before I do that, I'll talk a bit about what brought us to this place. So what are the key differences that characterize API management and service mesh management? When you look at traditional API management, very often the type of model that's used for traditional API management is one of a north-south model. It's all about 
creating a boundary to the enterprise and managing access across that enterprise boundary for, so that consumers can access only the resources that you want to expose. So essentially, it's a digital access point for the business, uh, a way to work with partners or with consumers who are implementing mobile applications or other web applications. The control point is the API gateway. That's the channel through which all communication is controlled, uh, usually in the DMZ. And all the communication through the gateway then gets forward to the different API backends. This is very much encapsulated in tr traditional API management. You have a developer portal. You have uh, approaches to onboard developers. They can find documentation for the APIs they want to use. They have a place where they can manage their credentials to access the APIs and analytics. So a lot, a lot of value on helping manage APIs that are exposed to the public. If we look at an illustration of that, this is an example of managing APIs for external clients, starting on the bottom row with a bunch of different API backends. So these are detailed APIs that have been implemented by different functions in the organization. And very often, you don't want to expose these raw APIs directly to end consumers because uh, developers would be overwhelmed on the complexity and often they'll want to just sign up for one set of credentials and use that one set of credentials to access multiple APIs. So many API management vendors have added an abstraction layer or a facade, the ability to define API products. And these create a simplified view of the APIs that make the APIs more consumable. In this example, rather than having five individual API backends, they've been simplified into three products which can be consumed. There's either a, a widget product, which is useful for building into a website. There's uh, an internet product, which is suitable for either building API access into websites or mobile applications. And then for partners, shipping partners, the this company has made a shipping product available, and that gives access to the logistics API and the tracking API. And the common thing across all of these is that the interface is the enterprise boundary. So all of the API clients are coming in across the enterprise boundary, and that's why we want to care so much about managing access and ensuring that we, we grant access to the right people. So this is traditional API management. If we have a look at service mesh and how to manage microservices, this is uh, a different type of model. If, if you compare it to the north-south, this is an east-west model. Within, API, within microservices, you know, uh, microservices typically use an API type paradigm. Uh, uh, communication between microservices looks very much like communication uh, to a REST API often, uh, although other protocols protocols can be used like RPC or uh, event messaging protocols. One of the things that's critical in implementation patterns for managing microservices is a clear separation of the control plane from the data plane. The most popular service mesh uh, implementation, Istio, accomplishes all of its powerful capabilities through exactly that, separating the data plane, which is typically Envoy running in sidecars, from Istio and Mixer, which is in the control plane. One of the key differences between microservices and traditional uh, external APIs is the sheer scale of things. In the past, you were talking maybe tens of APIs that would be exposed by company Whereas within a microservice cluster, you could be talking about thousands of microservices that all have to be talking to each other. And so you need a lot more sophisticated control and routing. Uh, a lot of this is to do with network capabilities for being able to trace uh, which services depending on which other services, enforcing security standards like mutual TLS, uh, providing black and white lists between, for communication between the services. All of these capabilities are provided and managed through the use of a service mesh. So we've seen now a very brief overview of what the two approaches look like. 
Let's ask ourselves then, is it really clear when we look at these environments brought together, you, here you have consumers who are accessing uh, a APIs through the enterprise boundary and the APIs are implemented in a microservice architecture. So is it clear when do you want to use API management and when do you want to use service mesh management? From what I described earlier, it should be very clear. So you've got an element of north-south management and there's an element of east-west management. If you lay that, overlay this onto the architecture we have here, it's very clear that you want to apply API management for external traffic, that interface to the enterprise boundary. Very often you would expose those different microservices in this facade of an API product. And then for the microservices themselves, you'd apply my service mesh management, and that would essentially be how you manage all of your internal traffic. Now, it looks great to have such a simple delineation between these two approaches, but things aren't quite so easy. So one of the challenges when we look at how this works in real environments, most enterprises are much, much larger than the simple use case. So in a typical large enterprise that we work with, we see that you have many, many different domain areas that uh, where, where applications are being developed and APIs and microservices are being implemented. And each of these domain boundaries are used to basically encapsulate groups of microservices. You can think of the microservices within a domain boundary as being like a pizza, uh, a, a pizza t table size team. And it's a group of developers that can work together. They can ask questions of each other. But when those microservices are being exposed to different areas of the company in a completely different domain area, then you're, to you're sharing an API interface with groups of people that you can't just talk to across the desk or that you're not used to talking every day. So you need to have more formalized interfaces, and that's the the uh, solid dots, the inter-domain APIs that need to be implemented. Within the domain areas themselves, you can continue using the same intra-domain microservice communication patterns as we saw in the previous slide. So the important thing here is that across domain boundaries, you essentially want to manage interfaces the same way as you do between the external clients and the enterprise boundary. So it's not black and white, there's a gray area and the nuance is to figure out when do you want to apply API management in these much larger and more sophisticated environments. In order to be able to guide us on some of these questions, you can think about what are the differentiating factors between inter-domain and intra-domain traffic. When you think about inter-domain traffic on the left-hand side, that's a, a lot more of a hierarchical relationship between the producer of the services and the consumer of the services. The Within the microservice cluster or the intra-domain traffic, that looks a lot more like a network graph and services are connected to each other within this network graph. The differences between the two are that on the left-hand side, you're talking generally about one-to-n relationships, and on the right, it's more typically one-to-one -one relationships. On the left, you want to take into account that you've got very different consumer groups. Some, some clients may be internal. You may be sharing the same APIs with external clients or pri external private partners. So you want to be able to differ differentiate very different roles for those different consumer groups. And that leads on then to the next point that in addition to authentication, you also want to be able to do authorization. It's the authorization contract that allows you to provide different roles and different access rights for different groups of consumers. Those authorization and access right policies are typically formalized in the shape of contracts uh, within Red Hat and Freescale. We, we use the concept of application plans to formalize these contracts on how a consumer will use a service. 
on the right hand side, what you typically find is that the consumers are part of the same team as the producer. So you don't need all of this complexity of formalized contracts. The contracts are a lot more implicit and you don't you don't need to worry about different types of consumer group because you know these are all the the developers that you hang out with at lunch um so or or over instant messaging is probably more appropriate in times of coronavirus and so you don't need to worry as much about formalizing contracts um it's enough to just do authentication you can forget about authorization and different types of access rights for different consumers and when it comes to being able to document those services, it's enough to just have internal documentation embedded within the code and people are all probably sharing the same GitHub re repository using different repos within the same organization, GitHub. So they just uh, browse through the different uh, repos to see how to use a different API endpoint. On the left-hand side, because you're not talking as closely with the developers, you need to provide a lot more guidance to help de developers discover the right API endpoints. You need to be able to help developers on board and you do that through a developer portal. And documentation needs to be a lot more sophisticated to help developers learn how to use the APIs. So here we've seen a, a clear picture. What, what are the things that do differentiate inter and inter and intra domain traffic. If you distill that into a very simple message, because um, the, the, simple, the bottom line is that on the left hand side, in situations where you want to apply API management, what you care about is the relationship between APIs or services and the consumers of those services. If you don't care about the relationship, because it's a one-to-one -one relationship and because the uh, different microservices are all managed by the same developer team, then you don't need the complexity and uh, uh, additional capabilities of API management. Then it's enough just to manage the, the services within the service mesh. Within the service mesh, the, the types of capability you need are center a lot more around network control. So it's how to be able to deliver advanced traffic control, how to ensure security between any two endpoints of the microservices. Um, and here often it's not even uh, validating credentials. It's making sure that you have mutual TLS, so um, quite different from uh, public APIs. Resilience is critical, so you want to have a lot more capabilities for things like circuit breaking. And observability is essential because you've got so many, so, so many thousands of services that are potential, potentially communicating. You want to make sure that you know what, what the communication patterns are in real life. So th those are the two key differentiating factors. And often you can just ask yourself these two questions for any endpoint to decide whether you need to apply API management or service mesh. But typically, um, in most cases, rather than thinking about one or the other, you want to think about using both together. Looking at how that comes together in an overall architecture, so this is sharing the Red Hat stack for application architecture. On the bottom, you have uh, the container platform and Kubernetes, so providing infrastructure right across the board. And then you could be running either traditional architecture, monolithic applications on top of that, or you could be running on the right-hand side, microservice architecture. If you're running a microservice architecture, very often you'll want to be managing that with a service mesh. And then on top, you'll be for the for the for all of the enterprise boundaries and the domain boundaries, you'll want to be applying API management. And you can do that across both traditional and microservice architectures. As you look at this model, it's important to recognize that there are very different stakeholders for each of these areas. When it comes to microservices and traditional architecture, of course, you have application developers that are creating the code and uh, service endpoints. On, on microservices, you also have Dev DevOps closely engaged in the management of the service mesh itself. 
And on the other hand, with API management, the key users of API management are folks who have a service owner responsibility or an API owner responsibility. And they're, they're, they're the ones who are responsible for promoting the API or service and ensuring that they know what types of consumer are allowed to use the service. I'll shoot through very quickly an integrated use case here. So this is a, a use case looking at, um, in blue boxes, we see new microservices. In the darker shade, there's a detail service, which is a legacy uh, implementation. So this is outside the, um, the container platform. Um, and then the entire service is being exposed as a product API. When exposing the product API, you want to make sure that external users can only access that product API. They cannot go directly to the review service or the rating service or the detail service. So all external access is managed through that product API. Within the setup, we'll show an example of using API management and service mesh and integrating the two. So looking at service mesh, uh, this is the most popular service mesh implementation based on Istio, where you have, uh, uh, in this example, two different services, service A and service B. Envoy is set up as a sidecar to each of those services. So it's a different container sharing the same pod. And Envoy handles all ingress and egress to the services within that pod. By doing so, Envoy can make policy enforcement checks and it, Envoy refers those policy decisions to the Istio mixer. So that's in the control plane. The integration to API management works by hooking in an API management adapter to that Istio control plane or the Istio mixer. On the API management side, it's a simple matter of uh, selecting the option to integrate with service mesh and then bring these two things together within the infrastructure on the data plane, you're not deploying API gateways separate from the control points that you deploy with the service mesh. So within the service mesh, you're already deploying Envoy sidecars as a traffic control uh, check for each service. So it would be completely redundant to deploy an API gateway in, in addition. That's the great thing of the integration, that you share the same infrastructure, there's no duplication. And then you can selectively choose within the entire service mesh which services you leave to be handled by traditional, uh, by, by standard service mesh capabilities and only enable API management for the control points which go across an enterprise boundary or a domain boundary. In this case, we've got the product API, which is where we want to apply API management. All requests for access through the product API are referred by Envoy to the Istio control plane and the, the policy enforcement is, and decision is handled by, by referring the decision to the API manager, that's Red Hat Freescale. So we've seen the, the paradigm, how to think about choosing between service mesh and API management for microservice environments. We've seen a quick example of that. One important thing as we think about how to roll this out in practice is that many organizations try to be too ambitious uh, and it's, it's the biggest, if, if I look at what one, one example that's consistent amongst organizations that do not succeed with microservice programs, it's because they try to do too many things at the same time. So my recommendation is that you think more selectively about deploying management for your microservice environments. Decide if you're going to start with an API management paradigm on the left-hand side or a service mesh paradigm on the right-hand side and then make sure that you deploy that capability, that management layer effectively. And, that, uh, and once you're happy with how that works, then start extending in either from the left to the right or from the right to the left. And once again, because you've got tight integration between these two approaches, you can easily migrate and extend capabilities. You will not have any duplication at the tra traffic control layer.
So this has been a quick overview. A key takeaway, uh, bear in mind, is that service mesh, always think about using that together with API management. It's not one or the other. And API management is about managing relationships, and service mesh is about advanced traffic control. I'll stop there and see if we have any questions. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, one question about uh, performance. How to minimize the impact of API management and API gateways uh, in, in service meshes? It's, it's a very common concern that customers have. And one of the key things is to take, uh, take full advantage of, of caching at every layer in the environment. So we build in a lot of caching capabilities into the adapter between Istio and Red Hat 3 scale. It's within the Istio project itself, there's been also a rethink about the, the model of a separate control plane and data plane. And Istio is uh, embarking on a new architecture where a lot of the policy decisions are going to be devolved to Envoy itself. So more of the policy decisions will be made by Envoy. And we're, we're going to be adapting the integration to, on, to Istio to also tie in directly with Envoy itself. So we're moving with the times and making sure that performance comes foremost. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one question about the, the, the culture. Uh, what's the right level of culture to uh, start a service mesh architecture? Maybe in a sense of, uh, you know, the level of mat maturity. So I, 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 it goes back again to, to my comment earlier to take measured steps. The, uh, the, the companies that that don't succeed very well and the, the cultures that don't uh, struggle are when they try to take on too much at the same time and they don't have a good structure. So uh, probably one of the biggest fails I have seen is a very large uh, uh, organization that had 700 microservices and they didn't really, it was completely uh, a complete wild west with every microservice team deciding what they would expose, who they would expose it to. And it was just uh, like a spaghetti code that you have within a monolithic application. So microservices are not going to help lack of structure in your organization. Get the organization structured first and then work on implementing microservices. Yeah, Conway's law, always. Thank <laughs> you, Mark. We're, we're out of time. Thank you. And yes, if you want to know more about uh, Mark's presentation or about uh, uh, service, mesh, uh, service meshes, Red Hat, you can go in the booth of Red Hat on, in the expo. We will be back at uh, in 18 minutes, uh, right for the break. And uh, yes, you can uh, begin to network or you can uh, visit the expo or do what you want. And then we will be back in 18 minutes on stage with uh, API specification in the in the first track or GraphQL to make business applications on the second track. See you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.